John in London, thank you for joining us. I want to start with you. So there has been a lot of talk about the race for technology supremacy, or sometimes maybe more narrowly, uh, the race for a semiconductor supremacy, mostly between the US and China and maybe some other players. Can you give us maybe a very short overview of where, in your view, that race currently stands? Is it even a race? Who's in the race? Who's winning the race? Well, those are all excellent questions, Nico. I think let's focus on semiconductors given the time at hand. No, there isn't a race in my opinion. Um, what we have is an integrated global system in which China occupies a certain role, the US another role, and likewise for other countries. And it's important to recognize that China's role is very much dependent on the others. So the export controls which people will have read about in the last few weeks um, target this very dependency of Chinese firms on inputs from more advanced technology providers in the US and allied countries. Um, it's an asymmetrical relationship. And so I don't think it's meaningful to talk about a race. What you have is an ambition on the Chinese side to upgrade through all means necessary and capture higher, higher value added positions within that integrated value chain. And they've had mixed success in doing that. But what the latest set of US export controls are doing quite expressly, and this is reflected in the policy statements from senior officials like National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, um, is to essentially freeze China's ability to advance past a certain level. And so the, if we take only the most recent round of export controls from October, what they target are Chinese access to certain types of advanced chips, um, in particular um, those related to artificial intelligence and supercomputing, and to certain types of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And there are also provisions concerning um, the uh, permissions required for U.S. persons to work with Chinese actors um, in the specified technologies. But again, the policy framing that has been given to this by the U.S. government is very much one of restricting Chinese technological progress in certain areas. Um, and that's given an express national security justification in terms of the need to maintain a technological lead over China. So um, perhaps just to tie this together, um, what we have is basically um, a perception on the US side, um, and increasingly this um, is the case that is being put to allied countries like um, most prominently at the moment, Japan and the Netherlands, that restricting Chinese technological progress is a national security imperative. So in that sense, I would say that um, it resembles something of the old Cold War in terms of the dynamic, um, but perhaps not um, in the sense of a symmetrical arms balance that people have in mind when you talk about, let's say, an AI or semiconductors arms race. Let me, before we expand the conversation beyond the sort of US-China semiconductor uh, dimension, just ask a quick follow-up. So it seems to me, while I, I totally understand sort of the, the immediate rationale behind the expert controls from a national security perspective, it seems to me like that kind of measurement is the kind of thing that 20 years later, everybody says, well, it was clear that that wasn't going to work. So how realistic is it that um, you know, one of the largest countries on the planet, one of the second largest economy on the planet can be cut off for what seems to have seems to me to have, need to be an indefinite period of time from one of the key technologies uh, that powers the world economy. So that, that it, it seems like a relatively short term measure. Am I reading that wrong? Well, it depends what you mean by cut off. And it's worth noting here that um, the U.S. Commerce Department has subsequently clarified the scope of application of some of the measures um, to indicate that they are not designed to cut off Chinese industry at a broad range of um, technology process nodes, but rather, um, again, to focus only on the most advanced stuff. Um, however, um, to your question, um, in terms of whether these will be effective or whether, as you've seen with other technologies in the past, um, China in this case, but um, also other countries in general will simply import substitute for technologies which they perceive as critical, which are denied to them through export controls. Um, I think, again, it really depends on the type, um, even within the semiconductor sector of technology you are talking about and the scale of use. So if we were to focus on military applications, for example, again, given that the national security justification is often advanced here, um, the semiconductors which have been found in Russian military equipment um, captured or abandoned in Ukraine over the course of this year, um, the vast majority of those have been 
manufactured by Western companies um, and in many cases have been export controlled, yet they still made it into Russian military gear. Um, what this indicates is that it's obviously very difficult to control the flow of goods, particularly if you're talking about small items like semiconductors. Um, and in Russia's case, certainly um, they're well-developed uh, mechanisms essentially for black market um, transfers of these chips in sufficient quantities to support a military capability. So there it's difficult to see um, how uh, export controls would be effective in denying complete access um, by the Chinese to uh, these particular technologies. However, if you're talking about um, the competitiveness of Chinese industry as a whole, then that's a very different proposition. And again here, we have to bear in mind it is an integrated industry. So industry leaders, whether we're talking about TSMC or Intel or ASML, um, pick the company. They all do what they do through a web of relationships with other companies. Um, and in particular, the ones at the technological frontier um, rely on being able to work with other leading firms in order to be able to stay at the top of the pile and to move their capacities forward. So this will be denied to Chinese companies um, by sweeping export controls mm -hmm. of the type that we've seen. Um, now, whether over, let's say, if you're talking about um, the short term as perhaps the next half decade beyond that time frame, um, Chinese firms can be prevented from reaching the technological levels which are being controlled today. I think that's a very much more open question. But their ability to close the gap with a moving technological frontier as everyone else continues to advance, I think that there they will face great challenges if this sort of this level of export controls is maintained. And in particular, if the cooperation of other countries whose firms are leading suppliers in this value chain is obtained. Thank you. Uh, Shotaro, you have covered for Nikkei Asia based in Jakarta, Southeast Asia, including the, the tech ecosystem and the, the consumer tech industry in Southeast Asia. Now, we've heard in the previous panel, um, uh, James Crabtree said that, that you know, many of these Southeast Asian countries are in, in, in kind of a bind um, between the US and China, uh, want to do nothing to annoy China now. If uh, the US and other like-minded nations, as John has explained, are sort of moving to get off China from part of these really important technologies, how is this being perceived by Southeast Asian uh, uh, countries, but also companies? Like, how are they trying to sort of future-proof their technological development, which they will depend upon um, from the sort of intensifying conflict with national security dimensions? I think one thing that people need to understand is that um, Southeast Asian countries, um, ASEAN countries, are very pragmatic in that they don't really care about where the money comes from, where the technology comes from, as long as it benefits them. So what ends up happening is you have a lot of American investors and Chinese investors sitting on the cap tables of major tech companies there. So there, there isn't really a, uh, you know, tr them trying to shelter themselves from the backlash, backlash against China. They are playing China and US and to some extent Japan and well, the West and the opposing faction of the world competing them saying, look, you know, give us give us your offers, whichever is good for us, we'll take. And I, th I think that's kind of, it, it's not to do with technology, but that happened with the high-speed rail that Indonesia was building uh, that was connecting Jakarta to Bandung, which is one of the uh, holiday destinations. Japan had initially thought they'd won it, but then China came back with a good offer and China is now building it. It was supposed to be completed by 2019. It hasn't been done, yet. but um, it's basically the, these countries want to play off these two factions each and play that to their advantage. And they, they understand that US, Japan, the Western nations and China wants to be influential in the region. And hence they, are, they know that they're in a strong position. They're in a strong bargaining position. I think many people sort of have a, of course, a good understanding of the the U.S. tech ecosystem. I think many people now have, a, have a, at least a rough understanding of the Chinese tech ecosystem. Uh, but to me, at least, sort of Southeast Asia is still a, a little bit of a black box. So, uh, can you talk a bit, if you, um, if that's possible, about sort of the characteristics? What sort of what kind of companies dominate this tech ecosystem? Where are they based? How, you know, are these companies maybe different from the ones that we're used to in sort of our daily tech lives? How's the, how how does that 
system look like in Southeast Asia? So there's currently 50 tech unicorns in Southeast Asia as of April this year, um, which is smaller than the US, even the UK, but still significant some when you think about, you know, the Southeast Asia's um, tech ecosystem only really starting to gather momentum in the past couple of years. Um, I think Southeast Asian tech companies have generally followed the major major tech companies in Southeast Asia have generally followed that of China in that many are pursuing the super app model where you have one app and then you can do anything on that app. So you can do food deliveries, ride hailing, uh, grocery shopping. Um, more and more companies are adding financial future, uh, features into them. And in a way, it's kind of a bit more advanced. Maybe advanced isn't the right word, but it's it's kind of, you know, it kind of maybe shows a future where the US might be going in the sense that Elon Musk, when he's, it was, you know, on acquiring Twitter, he was saying, look, this is one step towards creating what he calls X, which is the everything app, which is essentially is the, um, in the super app. So if anyone wants to see a glimpse of future where the US tech ecosystem might go, visit Southeast Asia, live there for a year and use all these super apps and that might, you know, that's that's something the US might uh, follow in the near future. We've also talked um, again in the previous panel already um, just a tiny little bit about sort of uh, supply chain uh, rearrangements and there's been plenty of reporting in the press about you know part of the uh, technology supply chain moving from China to Vietnam part of the supply chain moving from uh, China to India I again how is this perceived in the region it seems on the face of it like a large opportunity but also one that first has to be realized because of course none of these countries on their own have the capacity that China has so do you think we're going to be seeing a significant shift off this tech supply chain into Asian countries that are not China? So obviously, as you said, Vietnam has benefited a lot from, well, back in, even back in 2019, when the US-China trade spat was really you know, starting to boil over. So Vietnam is now producing more iPhones. Um, India, I think, is producing more iPhones, but Vietnam is doing that. A Foxconn is moving part of its operations to Vietnam from China. Um, and they've, I think, recently announced that their EV business, they're going to set up some manufacturing capacity in Thailand as well. Um, Indonesia, where I was based, obviously tried to um, catch this momentum. And they were coming up with special economic zones and industrial parks that offer tax incentives for companies trying to relocate out of China. And I visited one uh, when President Jokowi visited one of the industrial parks. This was during COVID, but it was quite a pompous cer uh, ceremony there. Um, he, they were, he was touting a lot of Japanese companies that have you know, announced, at, at least internally, to the Indonesian government that they were relocating from China. Uh, the funny story is I then went and checked with these Japanese companies and said, we haven't heard anything of that sort. We need to go back and check. So some of these were you know, kind of false promises, it seems. But as you said, the, they do have countries like Vietnam with a you know, large manufacturing um, sector can probably benefit from these kind of supply chain relocations. But other countries like Indonesia, which kind of lacks the manufacturing capacity, um, really will struggle. Having said that, um, Indonesia um, is trying to be a major player in the uh, electric vehicle manufacturing supply chain because they have a massive reserve of nickel. And what they've been doing is trying to control the export of nickel ores. They basically banned the export of nickel ores, telling the Chinese companies, the South Korean battery makers, look, if you want to be part of this, you have to come and set up factories here. And that, that involves technology transfers, um, knowledge sharing. So there's, there's different ways of trying to uh, build up their manufacturing cap capacities as well. Thank you. Um, John, one thing that I've always been really interested in is the question of how technology is regulated by governments. So I think we tend to have this narrative of technology of being in, entirely driven by innovative companies, but of course you know, the, the regulations and, and the export controls are just one example of that play a huge role. It, it, my impression is that interestingly, uh, if you look at the global landscape, both China and the EU seem to be taking a relatively 
uh, active approach in, in regulating uh, technology, although the way they intervene may be different. Man, maybe uh, the U.S. and many Southeast Asian nations have a more lightweight approach. Would you, first of all, is that I know it's an oversimplification, but generally, would you agree that you and China sort of are relatively active in trying to rel um, uh, regulate how technology works? And can you maybe talk a little bit about how you know, the Chinese government or different elements of the Chinese government so think about regulating the technology. What is the goal of the regulation? What should it ultimately achieve? Sure. Well, perhaps if we start with the United States, I think it depends which time period you're talking about, because as many in the audience will know, Silicon Valley owes a lot to government funding and government research institutes. And many people are now saying that the problem in the United States has been the lack of sustained government support industrial policy over the last 20 to 30 years, whether you agree with the perspective or not. Um, the laissez-faire um, attitude towards tech capitalism um, that we associate with contemporary Silicon Valley and the United States is really a product of the current generation. Um, and I think this is true everywhere, that if you look particularly at advanced technologies, there is a strong role for the state everywhere. Um, we hear a lot about TSMC, for example, or Samsung as leading semiconductor fabrication providers and um, uh, in Samsung's case, also um, a, a leading chip company in many other ways. Um, I mean, these are national champions that are poster children for status industrial policy, not for free market economics, frankly. So I think um, we do need to nuance this picture. In terms of the Chinese approach, well, um, China has always had a hands-on industrial policy throughout the reform and opening era. Obviously, um, much has changed since the Maoist period. But I would say that um, it has never been the case that the market has been left to do its thing, except in very particular areas, such as in the initial decades, at least, um, the consumer internet platform sector. Um, so the sorts of um, uh, the Alibaba's, Tencent, some the Baidu's, and so on. But what you are seeing now in China is a reassertion of the state's role across the economy, um, and in particular in the internet space, um, where, let's be frank, governments around the world have realized that a complete absence of regulation, the dream of the totally free and open internet is an illusion. It is not something which governments have realized is compatible with social stability or with national security. And so you are seeing governments around the world reassert themselves. And I imagine, Michael, that you were thinking of not only in the EU context of GDPR, but um, the new package of legislation which is coming through the EU Parliament, um, which will impose an increasing degree of regulation on what happens in cyberspace. China at the moment is the leader in this area um, and has the most extensive regulatory regime for data management and cybersecurity. But you are seeing other countries follow because the policy imperative and the logic of this um, is apparent to everyone. Obviously, in the case of China, um, the political imperatives are somewhat different. Um, and there, I think that you really are seeing um, if uh, I can use Bill Clinton's famous phrase, the Chinese Communist Party nailing the jello to the wall. They have reconciled um, the contradiction between the internet as a technology that enables the free flow of information with a political system that is ultimately about control. Um, and a lot of the debates, obviously, around how we should interact with China and Chinese technology come back to this. So would you would you agree that measured against its own goals, the Chinese government is the most successful technology regulator on the planet right now? Well, again, um, I hate to keep on saying it's complicated, but it really is. I mean, if we take an example like the semiconductor industry, um, if you simply look at the quantitative targets that they set in the now infamous Made in China 2025 development plan, no, they haven't met those goals, but that's because they were unrealistic in the first place. You can't say that Chinese industrial policy for this sector has been a complete failure over the past, let's say, two decades, though actually the Chinese government has been trying to promote semiconductor development for longer than that. But even if we just look, let's say, back 20 years or so, then you do see Chinese firms moving up the value chain, plugging certain critical technology gaps. The problem is that the technologies are so complex and diverse, and the gap with the foreign industry leaders is so large that that gap has not been closed and China remains again highly dependent mm. on its interactions with the global economy which is recognized by the senior leaders. Xi Jinping himself talks a lot in his speeches um, though this gets less attention than the stuff about self-reliance about the need to remain plugged into the global economy because clearly there's an understanding at the top of the Chinese system 
that they cannot do this completely alone. Now, again, if we talk about um, relative success, um, I think there are many ways you can measure that. If we look at China's data regulatory regime, um, certainly there have been voices within China itself, um, despite the very difficult environment for contrarian views there these days, pointing out that um, pointing out the chilling effects of the amount of regulation, the lack of internal consistency, and the other uncertainties that have been brought in by the mass of laws and rules and new bureaucratic channels which have been imposed on Chinese activity in cyberspace over the past few years. And certainly um, the impression that one gets is that the Chinese entrepreneurial community um, is very scared now of forging ahead in the way that they did for the previous two decades. But whether this remains the case going forwards, um, or whether this is an initial shock in which will be shaken out through the system, as it puts in place, fleshes out the details of those rules um, to develop internal data markets some better mm -hmm. data sharing, um, better supervision by the state of critical information infrastructure vulnerabilities, I think it's too early to say. So again, time frame is very important and what we're talking about um, will determine the, the judgment that we make. Thank you. Um, and I think actually we're, uh, surprisingly to me, running a bit ahead of time so we can we can spend a few more minutes or a few also very interesting questions from the audience that I want to get to. Uh, Shotara, very quickly first to you. So. One thing I found striking is that there's quite a bit of fear um, in, in, in Europe and, and possibly also in the US sort of of uh, Chinese technology and you know mm -hmm. it being able to sort of ultimately use to, to control or interfere. Um, there's been you know obviously huge pushback against uh, 5G equipment from companies like Huawei. And I just read the other day um, in, in Nikkei Asia, uh, no less, that the picture in Southeast Asia is different. There is definitely a lot of skepticism towards uh, you know Chinese uh, involvement in the economy, but there's more pushback towards industrial companies who bring their own staff and there's almost no pushback sort of on the tech side, on the mm -hmm. hardware side. Is, is that something that you can explain? Why is that, why is sort of that, that fear of technological interference maybe less developed in Southeast Asia than it is in Europe? And I'm not saying it's justified, I'm just right. interested in the perception. I mean, as I said, you know, Southeast Asian countries are pragmatic if China comes with a cheap, um, alternative that works well in the context of Southeast Asia, then they have they really have no reason to say no to that. And there's obviously in ASEAN Southeast Asia see ASEAN centrality is very important to countries in ASEAN. So in that sense, whether it's China or whether it's US, whether it's Europe, whether it's Japan, it doesn't really matter. Of course, there are concerns from the Western world that China might be doing nefarious stuff, but to the Southeast Asian people's eyes, there's no reason to think that the US won't spy on them if they use US technology or use Japan technology. So in that sense, again, they're playing off the two spheres of the world in order to extract a good bargain for them. So th this, this is why the U US rhetoric of look if you use chinese technology you're in you know you you're endangering your national security that doesn't really resonate mm. with them and they're more preoccupied with their internal disinformation like the presidential election that i covered in 2019 that was filled with you know false fake news um disinformation from internal sources mm. to political parties with political factions within Indonesia fighting against each other on the internet sphere. So they're more focused on tackling that problem rather than worrying about a state entity coming and trying to compromise their cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And of course, we're going to, of course, come back to the disinformation question in, in the first session after lunch. Let me bring in uh, a question from the audience, uh, which I find is interesting. And it's, it's correct in, in saying that we have been focused quite a bit on hardware in this, this short conversation on tech. And the question is, you know, should we not be focusing more on software, on how digitalization is developing in Asia and how it is embraced by young generations around the world? So is not that, in effect, going to go, uh, going to make a bigger difference, John? Is the hardware question even that relevant? Well, the software depends on the hardware. That's why the hardware has been targeted by U.S. export controls. Obviously, the context is a bit different for Southeast Asia. I don't think that Indonesia is particularly worried about being subjected to U.S. export controls in future, though 
it might be worth pointing out here that other countries do watch how the United States wields its power in this space. Um, the choke points occupied by its firms upstream in supply chains and the importance of the US market that allows the US to effectively wield extraterritorial jurisdiction to execute policies like this and do contemplate whether some level of diversification is in their long term national interest. I mean, in the case of the Russia Ukraine context, um, obviously, there has been some reporting about um, for instance, the uh, interest of countries like India in developing um, or reducing their reliance on the US dollar for fear that the same sorts of sanctions which have targeted Russia will be used against them, even if there's no near term prospect of that. But coming back to the issue of software versus hardware, I think from a Southeast Asian viewpoint, um, realistically, these countries will be hardware technology takers um, for the foreseeable future, simply because, again, the technologies are so complex that there is no real prospect of them developing the capacity themselves. I mean, we have seen how difficult it has been for China. Admittedly, they've done many things wrong, but also with all their advantages, they have had quite limited success um, in the semiconductor industry, for example. So for a country like, let's say, Indonesia or the Philippines, um, really focusing on software is probably um, the and uh, developing the human capital to take advantage of different software applications is probably the smarter play um, going forwards. Um, I mean, Shotaro mentioned the EV sector in Indonesia and the uh, advantages that it has in terms of being one of the leading um, raw material suppliers. Again, people will have read about um, the uh, idea of a battery OPEC and the way that Indonesia might be able to lead to this um, to gain a foothold on, let's call them hardware supply chains in this industry. But as a general rule, um, the entry barriers for getting into the software industry, whatever we're talking about, are lower, um, which is one reason why China and India have also been quite successful in this over the past couple of decades. And so, yes, I do think that um, you will see um, Southeast Asian countries, um, and you already see this, in fact, reflected Indonesian government policy and um, that of certain other countries, um, focusing on developing the human capital, plugging themselves into supply chains, which are dominated in terms of the foundation of technologies by other countries, um, to ride the wave. Um, and of course, um, the benefits that these countries, um, larger economies may gain from smart utilization of software. Um, again, we can see an example in the way in which software applications um, have been used in China, um, the so-called super apps that Shotaro referred to before. Um, they are being used in innovative ways for education delivery and other basic services as well as for pure consumption. So. It is certainly uh, an intelligent development strategy, I think, for um, developing nations in a context where the hardware, the foundational technologies are realistically going to be mostly out of reach. Maybe one last question from the audience. Um, I think that's also going to be one for you, John. Um, short question, short answer, please. China has a semiconductor gap. I think we've talked about that um, already. So uh, the question I'm going to slightly rephrase is that if you know if you were advising the Chinese government on what is the best way of sort of ultimately overcoming this gap, what would you do? I would advise them to go back 10 years and do what they were already doing, which I think is what they wish they could do, but they no longer have that option because the political environment has deteriorated so much between them and particularly the United States, but also other technology leaders. So in Europe, for example, it's not the same conversation about um, the cost benefit of doing business with China as it was even three or four years ago. Um, once again, I just um, emphasize that China cannot compete with the leading economies, the US being at the center as an autarkic player. It has got where it has got in technology terms by being part of an integrated global economy. Now that's not to say that China couldn't be technologically autarkic and you might see that choice forced on it, but it is certainly not the best outcome from the Chinese authorities viewpoint. Um, and I think they're quite aware of that. Um, what I would suggest to the policymakers in Beijing, if they were to ask my opinion, is that finding a way to try and meet the concerns of Western governments halfway, despite um, the extremely adverse political environment um, in Washington and increasingly in European capitals regarding um, the views of China and in particular the Chinese Communist Party, um, finding a way to reconcile um, or to ameliorate 
these concerns rather than doubling down on the language of self-reliance um, and of um, making China into a cyber superpower and the other rhetoric that we have been given over the past decade um, would be the best path towards um, smoothing uh, China's ongoing links with the international economy. But frankly, I'm not optimistic that that's the path that China and indeed the world is on. Thank you very much. Um, and that will already bring us to the end of this panel. The reason I ask this last question and, and ask it to John is that if you're interested in, in this topic and you want to know a little bit more, John was a guest um, in a virtual Oxford debate that we hosted at Asia Society about a month ago. You can find a video online uh, where we go into much more depth on sort of the, the question of whether China can win the race for semiconductor supremacy. With that, thank you very much, John Lee in London, Jatarotani here on stage um, for these insights um, on the state of technology. Again, I know much more to say. Uh, we're going to end it here and, and, and move on to the next thing. Thank you very much.